This is Pastor Randy Tinker at Trenton Ministry Center. I want to thank you for watching our program today. At TMC, we believe that through Jesus, we can change our city and impact our world. I pray you are blessed by today's program. I stand. Can I tell you this morning, the earth has never and the world has never been on sinking sand like it is today. Things we've never thought would happen, things we never thought we would see, things we never even thought about are happening right before ours. Bible prophecies being filled every day of our lives. Things that we, we often talked about when I was growing up, and they'll talk about the signs of the Lord return. I thought, that that's not happening now, but now that I'm older, it's happening. Anybody testify with me? It only points me to one thing, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and that it and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. He's coming. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a fairy tale. This morning we're going to continue looking at what we started last week. Abraham, Muhammad, and Jesus. And all this is pointing to one thing. Jesus is the only way. Look at me close. Jesus is not a way. There's not many paths to God. There's not but one way to God, through Jesus Christ, His Son. Now listen to me. Allah is not a way. Muhammad is not a way. Buddha is not a way. Confucius is not a way. Charles Russell is not a way. Mormonism is not a way. Jesus. 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 If you don't know Jesus, you're lost. If Jesus has not saved you, you're lost. Man can't save you. A denomination can't save you. A religion can't save you. Being good enough can't save you. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's amazing that what I'm going to share with you this morning, if I was in certain locations, they'd call for my head. They really would. Go with me to Genesis chapter 16. Beginning with verse 11. Genesis chapter 16, beginning with verse 11. We read some of these scriptures last week. We're going to read some of the same ones again this week. If you'll bear with me through the help of the Lord. Somebody says, Pastor, why are you preaching on these things? Because we need to know them. Can I tell you that uh, Islam... And, and being Muslim is not something that is just in the Middle East anymore. It's not something that we just um, hear about over there. It's, it's here. I'm going to share some of these things with you. I'm about to get ahead of myself. Genesis chapter 16, beginning with verse 11. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, being Hagar, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, and his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. Father, help me this morning to do, God, what I can't do. I need your help every step of the way this morning. By no means do I claim to be a scholar, but I am a preacher of the gospel. So, God, anoint me, God. Put your hand upon me, God, like you would just put your hand into a glove and use me. God, open up our hearts and minds today in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Tell somebody it's good to see you and you can be seated. You didn't have to tell them they could be seated. I forgot to say that. <laughs> Almost every week, and yeah, even daily, we are hearing the terms like Islam, radical Islam, Muslim, Allah, ISIS, mosques. We hear those things often. Most Christians only know this about Islam. We associate that with terrorism. That's about all we know about them. We associate Islam with terrorism. Something you need to know today is this. The fastest growing religion on the planet is Islam. I'm going to take my time this morning, so I'll just go ahead and warn you up front. The fastest growing religion on planet Earth is Islam. In about 30 years or less, Islam will rival Christianity, even here in the United States. 
You say, well, that won't bother me. What about your kids? What about your grandchildren? We need to know about this. More importantly, we need to know what God says about this. This morning, we're going to continue to look at Abraham, Muhammad, and Jesus. And this morning, we're going to look at particularly the rise of Islam. Last week, we talked about Judaism and how God told Abraham, the whole world will be blessed through you. And how that did not mean that everyone would be Jews. The blessing and the promise that God gave to Abraham, that out of Abraham would come Jesus. That was the promise. It wasn't the Jewish faith. It was Jesus. Are we on the same page this morning? Way back in Genesis, God promised the world, I'm sending you a Savior, and his name shall be called Jesus. You need to know that. We need to know that just because God gave the promise to Abraham, as some thinks, it doesn't mean that out of him would come the Jews, although the Jews did come forth out of Abraham, the promise that Jesus would come forth out of the Jewish nation. Through the line of Abraham, through the line of David, Jesus would come. And the whole world would be blessed because of Jesus Christ. You mean to tell you why the United States of America is blessed? It's not because we're rich. It's not because of anything else except for one thing. Hear me well. We were founded as a nation upon biblical principles. That's why the United States of America is blessed. Listen to me close. I believe we're blessed because we we honor Israel, but the real reason we're blessed is because we honored God first. Come on now. Last week, we told the fact that Abraham had two sons. One was the son of promise, Isaac. The other, the son of Hagar, the maidservant, Ishmael. And now that Ishmael's descendants would be wild and against everyone, and everyone would be against them. That was last week. That's where we pick up today. It's important you know this before I go further. There was no such thing as Islam, no such thing as a Muslim, even in the Old Testament. It didn't exist. Even in the time of Jesus, it did not exist. After the death and the burial and resurrection and the eventual ascension of Jesus Christ, Christianity began to spread everywhere. On Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit showed up in the upper room and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance as Pentecostals, we hold claim to that right there pretty good, and we should. And they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they did speak with tongues, but the purpose of Pentecost was not so they could speak in tongues. Come on now, preacher. Okay, I will. The reason they were filled with the Holy Ghost and the reason they spake with other tongues was, number one, so that they could be witnesses in Judea and Jerusalem into the uttermost parts of the world. They did speak with tongues, and I think that's pretty miraculous because the Bible says that the people around them thought that these men were ignorant. They were unlearned, but yet they're speaking in our own language. Why did that happen? Because they came out of the upper room on fire, and they began to spread Jesus everywhere, and the disciples dispersed, and the people they converted dispersed, and while they were under persecution, they went into all the world and preached this name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Anybody in the house this morning? Amen. So they went and they began to preach Jesus to the uttermost parts of the world. As a matter of fact, by the year 300, Christianity was adopted as the state religion of Rome. I think that's ironic, being that they wanted to put him to death. And later, he's now the state religion of Rome. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Christianity was spreading, but there was one part of the world where it wasn't spreading quite as fast, if at all. It was that section of the world that we know as Saudi Arabia, or what we would know back in the Bible days as just as Arabia. During this time, Jews and Christians began to migrate into the Arabian Peninsula. You've heard that a lot on the news as well, around Yemen and Saudi Arabia. They lived at peace among the Arabs. And when the Arabs heard of Moses and the Old Testament and they heard about Jesus and the New Testament, they started asking themselves, what happened to us? The Jews have a book. The Christians have a book. The Jews have prophets. The Christians have prophets. We don't have a book. We don't have any prophets. In the year 16 that all began to change, a businessman named, during the month of Ramadan, a businessman named Ubal Qasim who would eventually be called Muhammad. Somebody says, Pastor, you sound more like a scholar than a preacher. Trust me, I'm not a scholar, but I'll give you some background before I preach. Is that all right? 
this guy, who would later be called Muhammad, went into a cave. And he went home and he told his wife and his cousin about a revelation that he had from God. He was illiterate, but he would tell the revelations and they would write down what he said. For two years, he would go into this cave and meditate and come back and tell them what he saw, and they would write down what he saw, what he come up with. Later on, while living in the city of Mecca, he started to speak out and started to share publicly about his writings and the revelations that he thought he had saw. As a result of his speaking out, he gathered a following. Can I just stop here and tell you, today we live in such a time, you can go out and tell anything you want, make up anything, and you'll get a following. That's another sermon altogether. He got a following, and they started to listen to him, and and they were enamored with him. They thought he was really good. He told the Arab people, there is one God, just like the Jews have one God, Allah is one God. Just like the Christians have one God, Allah is one God. There is one God, and his name is Allah. That's what they began to preach, or what Muhammad began to preach. When he preached this, people came and followed him. In those days, he encouraged them to turn. Listen to this. I found this interesting. In those days, he encouraged his followers to turn to Jerusalem and pray because he had been taught by the Jews. He knew about Moses, and he knew about Abraham, and he knew about Jesus. And because of tradition, he knew that everybody else prayed to Jerusalem. So in the beginning, he told them to turn to the city of Jerusalem and pray. He encouraged them to do it because of Abraham and Moses and the others. In his early teachings, he focused mainly on the injustices of the Arab society. It was not uncommon for the rich landowners in Saudi Arabia to to lord and to make slaves over those that were poor. And Muhammad preached against this, telling them that they needed to be gracious and they needed to be merciful to those who do not have as much. Doesn't sound so bad so far. He became a champion of justice and his following increased. And because of his influence, he grew and grew and grew. Now, of course, when you have a following, you have a group that loves you and a group that hates you. He had a group that loved him and a group that hated him. They wanted to do away with this new religion because he was hurting some of the economy. He was hurting the rich landowners. So, get this, in, six, in the year 616, a law was passed that it was illegal to marry a Muslim. And it became so hard for Muhammad and his followers that he gathered about 70 families and moved from Mecca to Medina. In Medina, there were several Jewish tribes. So when Muhammad arrived there, these Jewish tribes began to share their faith. And there he found out Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And he found out the tradition that Ishmael had moved to Arabia. And, And he believed by tradition that had been told that while Adam was the first man, that Adam somehow went to Mecca, and he built a shrine there. And then later, Abraham came back to Mecca, and he, built, and he rebuilt the shrine that Adam had built. He heard all of these things and all of these traditions, so he began to do this there. And he began to share his ideas even more. He found out all these things, and it opened his eyes to some new ideas. And he understood that the Arabs had a bloodline right back to Father Abraham. And it intrigued him. So he started his preaching his own version of the Old Testament. And when he started preaching his own version of the Old Testament, the Jewish people began to be upset, and the Christians began to be upset. Let me just stop here and tell you, you cannot share a new version from the Bible. You cannot share any new ideas about the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God, and it is the final authority. There never has been a man, nor will there ever be a man that can change what the Scripture says because he wants to. Amen? Two years later, he even had a greater following, and he declared himself a prophet of the one true God. At this point, he said, You no longer pray to Jerusalem. Now you turn and face Mecca when you pray. In other words, we are severing all ties with the Jewish community. We are severing all ties with the Christian community. We are by ourselves. We don't believe anything about them. Now it's just us. We're our our own religion, and we serve only one God. And it is not Yahweh, and it is not Jehovah, but it is Allah. He began to preach this. They lived in an agricultural area where there was a lot of farmers, but these guys were not farmers. They had no way to get food because they wasn't farmers. 
So they took up the sword and began robbing the merchants and the caravans that came through their region. They were, event- they were essentially pirates. They robbed people and took their food and took their supplies just so they could survive. The people in Mecca did not like this. They put together an army of about 10,000 people to go and march on Medina and, and Muhammad. Muhammad only had 3,000 followers at this time, and the Meccans had about 10,000. And when the Meccans marched on Medina where Muhammad was at, believe it or not, Muhammad and his 3,000 defeated the Meccans and their 10,000. And because of this, people said, ah, Allah really is with Muhammad because he defeated the 10,000 with only his 3,000. And what happened? His fame became even more. At this point, they became very, very warlike people even at this point because people believed he had heard from God because he defeated this great army. They believed the blessings of God was upon him. They became militant and they marched on Mecca, finally took Mecca. And they found a group of Jews at this point. And when Muhammad and his followers found this group of somewhere between 700 and 900 Jews, they had had a plantation of dates, and they they saw how they could use it. Because back then, dates meant money. They really did. That's how they traded. That's how they kept their livelihood. What did Muhammad do? He and his followers killed somewhere between 700 and 900 Jews, enslaved the women, and took all of them captive that he didn't kill. After taking Mecca, after killing all these Jewish people, two years later, in the year 630, Muhammad died. Now, there was another conflict. Who will take leadership? What will we do now? Two thoughts arose. Remember the cousin that he shared his revelations down, shared his revelations down with, and his cousin would write those down? There's one section that said, this guy, his cousin, should be the leader now of the Muslims. But there was another section that said, no, we should elect someone as our leader. And they eventually split. And this is how they become, this is how they become, you probably heard this before, the Sunnis and the Shiites. That's how they become. These two groups separated. Now the Sunnis and the Shiites. Shiites trace their roots back to Muhammad and his cousin. And the Sunnis trace theirs back to election of a leader. This is how Islam came into being. That's a very brief history. Now I want to preach. That was my foundation. You've got to know what I was preaching about. Is that all right? Good. Two people said go forward. Listen to me carefully. The religion of Islam, their goal, their intent is to take over the world and convert everyone to Islam. That's their intentions. By any means necessary. Listen to your pastor. I'm not preaching to waste your time. They are very serious about what they're doing. Do you hear me this morning? They are very serious about what they're doing. Now, before I go forward, you've got to understand something. I talked with some of the elders or some guys in the back about this this morning. We are at a crossroads in Christianity. We cannot stand behind our pulpits and preach that Jesus hates Muslims. Are you hearing me? I want to tell you something that will shock you, and you may not even like it, but I'm going to tell you like it is anyway. Muslims are welcome in this church because I pray that they hear about Jesus and they accept him as the Lord and Savior of their life. By no means am I here to preach to you this morning that you should hate Muslims because if I do, then I'm not preaching Jesus. Or understood this morning, and I'm not here to tell you, you need to be afraid of Muslims. Listen to me. Not every Muslim is a terrorist. There's people in this room that probably work with a Muslim. Just because you work with somebody that's a Muslim does not mean they want to take your head off. Are you with me this morning? I've got to tell you the truth because if we're not careful, we'll get so far on the other side of the fence that we're not preaching the love of Jesus anymore. If Jesus saved you, he can save a Muslim. Are you with me? So we've got to understand that. We, gotta underst- we, ha- we must love Muslims. If we don't, then we're not followers of Jesus either. Good stuff here, but you got to stay with me and understand that. So don't, just because you're a Muslim, yes, every Muslim needs to know Jesus because he's the only way. But every Muslim doesn't want to take your head. 
See, I've already upset somebody because you want me to get up here and say, you should hate them because they want to kill you. That's not true. In the, they have another, they have the Quran, then they have some writings of Muhammad that are called the Hadith. One of their sacred writings of Muhammad says this, I have been ordered to fight against the people until they testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So you, you can see there by his own writings, the military force is at the heart of their movements with some of these folks. You can see it. It's in their writings. In fact, let's bring it home where we know what's true. In fact, we're beginning to see this all the time. Last year in the, in, last year in the summertime, which started way before that, but my focus goes back to last year and the beginning of this year, how ISIS controlled the northern part of Iraq and how that Christians there were, were thrown out of their homes that had to leave the city and were being beheaded and killed and had to run to the mountains and were dying on the side of the road because they had no food and water because Islam was saying either convert or be killed. I'm not making this up. You can go look it up. If you saw the news, you saw it. To date, and this number is probably conservative because there's this number and then there's another number, but to date, ISIS has reportedly killed, listen to me, I'm not making this up, 24,000 people who believe in Jesus. That should disturb you. That should disturb me. People like you who were born-again believers died because they served Jesus. One number even went as high as 175,000. They're being burned alive. Their children are being raped. Their children are being beheaded. And I know our thought is this. Well, that's over there. Honey, they're here. There is, if I, if I, if I remember right, there is, 21, listen now, I'm not talking about Egypt or Iraq or Iran. There are 21 terrorist, known terrorist training camps in the United States. And nobody's doing nothing about it. This kind of preaching is dangerous, by the way. I could preach about the Holy Ghost all day long and not upset the world. But when I preach about what I'm preaching this morning, it upsets the devil. But I, when I'm up here, I really don't care. Now, when I get down there, I might, but right now, I'm under the anointing. I'm just going to preach the Word of God. Just the last few weeks, we saw scores of Coptic Christians that were beheaded. You saw it. You saw them talk about it. And they were given an option that goes back to the days of Muhammad. Three options. You convert. You pay a tax. Or you die. You convert to Islam. You pay a tax them, give them money to stay what you are, which they really won't let you, or they'll kill you. This sermon is a comparison of Islam and Christianity and the search for the truth. Listen to me. Only the truth can set you free. Islam is an Arabic word that means submission and peace. The word Muslim means submission. So therefore, Islam is a religion, and a Muslim is one who follows that religion. They believe in one God, and his name is Allah. They believe that Allah has revealed himself through his sacred writings, his teachings, and his commandments that came through his angels, messengers, and prophets. Islam claims to be of the same faith as all the children of Abraham. Islam claims that Allah used the prophet Moses to write the Torah, the prophet Jesus to reveal the scriptures. Let me stop there. You've probably been misinformed and told that Muslims don't believe in Jesus. They do believe in Jesus. They just don't believe he's the Savior. They believe that Jesus was a prophet, but they believe that Muhammad is the last and greatest prophet. Islam does give validity to the Bible and the writers of the Bible, but it doesn't claim the Bible to be inerrant as they do their holy Quran. Muhammad was the last prophet, they believe, and he sealed all prophecies. Islam is looking for a Messiah to come. 
Last week I told you the Jews are looking for a Messiah to come. I must tell you again, the Messiah has already come and there will be no other. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, has already come. And he will come again, but this time he will receive his own to himself. The Messiah that the Jews are looking for is none other than the Antichrist. And the Messiah that Islam is looking for is none other than the Antichrist. I told the fellows in my office this morning, y'all pray for me because I have three weeks of series to preach in one morning. Let's compare Islam and Christianity. Islam says there is one God, and his name is Allah. Guys, if you could throw Mark 12 and 29 up there, please. Christianity says there is one God, and his name is Jesus. Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Islam says Allah has No begotten children. I know you know this verse, but throw John 3.16 up there because God has one begotten son. For God so loved the world, the world, the world, the world, everybody in it, every religion, red, yellow, black, and white, Muslim, Buddhist, uh, Mexican, Russian, American. It doesn't matter who you are. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever... Whoever, 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 whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's our Jesus. Allah has many sacred writings other than the Quran. But Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, Jehovah has one sacred text for the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is but one word, and it is the word of the living God. Do you hear me? People are dying all over the world and begging for a copy of what you have 20 of with dust on it. Islam believes that Allah is the creator of all. But in John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, we find out Jehovah created all things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2 says, He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says, All things were made through Him. Through who? Through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm about to get happy up here. Islam believes that the last prophet was Muhammad. Christianity believes that the last prophet was John the Baptist who said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Islam believes their Messiah is yet to come. But in John chapter 14 and verse 3, Jesus the Messiah has already come. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. In order to come again, you had to be here once. I will come again. Here's the good part. And receive you unto myself where I am. There. You may be also. Muhammad never made a promise like that. Help me, Jesus. Islam says there will be a final judgment. Christianity says there is a final judgment. Islam says there is a paradise and a hell. Christianity says there is a heaven and there is a hell. Let's look at Allah and Jehovah. Christians and Muslims both claim to serve one God. Islam claims that Allah, an Arabic word, is God, and Christians claim Elohim, a Hebrew word. But Islam says they're one and the same. In 1992... There was an author by the name of Robert Morey who wrote a book entitled The Islamic Invasion. In his book, he says that Allah was actually the name of a moon god in the city of Mecca where Muhammad was born. 
He claims that Muhammad proclaimed a monotheistic religion, which is a belief in one God. But those, but he rather he chose the moon God as the only God. Islam refutes this claim and says that Allah is the same as Elohim to the Jewish people or Jehovah to the Christian. Now, there's a good reason why this writer, Robert Morey, believes that Allah came from a moon God. I want you to stay with me. We'll clarify some of this as we go along. I hope you're not bored. There is good reason to believe that Allah may have been a moon God, literally. Because at the Kaaba, remember last week we talked about the Kaaba, which is the rock that's in Mecca, where the big mosque is, where people travel millions every year to go and worship. There's a rock there that's called the Kaaba. And at this Kaaba, before Islam, there was 360 other idols. And one of those was a moon god named Allah. Research it. Don't take my word for it. I invite you when I preach, look it up. Read your word. You got you to gotta study. I don't invite you to believe everything I say. I invite you to go look up what I say. Is that all right? Muslims say he's not a moon god, but rather creator god. Let's look at the Bible and the Quran. The Bible is full of prophecy and power, and the product of the Bible is changed lives. Did you hear me? The product of the Bible is changed lives. The Quran contains parts of the Old Testament, parts of the Gospels, revelations of Muhammad. Muslims claim that the Quran was written in perfect Arabic in every respect. And that Allah wrote it in heaven. However, according to scholars of which I am not, who have studied the Quran, say otherwise. It contains many words and phrases that are not even Arabic. The Quran gives, listen to these conflicting reports, and this is in their Quran. The Quran gives four conflicting reports of how Muhammad received, or or how Muhammad was called to be a prophet, rather. In chapter 53 of the Quran, it claims Allah appeared to him and called him a prophet. In chapter 26 of the Quran, it claims the Holy Spirit called him. In chapter 15 of the Quran, it claims the angels came down and told him. But in chapter 2, it claims that the angel Gabriel came down and called him and handed him a copy of the Quran. Which one's right? It's all in the same book. There's a section in the Quran that is called the Satanic Verses in which Muhammad, in a moment of weakness, listen to me, their prophet, in a moment of weakness and temptation, gave in to a pressing crowd and gave them permission to worship the three daughters of Allah. Are you with me? I thought Allah had no children. They would say Allah had no children. But guess what? Allah, the moon god, had three daughters. Al-Allah, Al-Lat, and Al-Azah. That was the three daughters of the moon god. Allah had three daughters. Are you with me? Islam claims monotheism, the belief in one god, to be their greatest doctrine. Yet Muhammad allowed the worship of other gods in his moment of weakness. That's in, it was rather, and the Quran in chapter 53. I'm not making this stuff up. Muhammad later claims that Gabriel came down and rebuked him for allowing people to worship other gods. After Muhammad's death, these verses were uh, removed from the Quran. How convenient. However, it's well documented in their religion and in their writings. Here's the deal. Either the Quran or the Bible has to be an error because both can't be right. The Quran gives the name of Abraham's father as Azar, while the Bible claims his father is Terah. One of them's got to be wrong. The Quran claims that Abraham rebuilt a temple in Mecca and that that Adam had originally built. The Bible gives a physical map of of the life of Abraham and never says anything about him going to Mecca. The Quran claims that Abraham went to sacrifice his son Ishmael on the altar, but the Bible says it was Isaac. 
The Quran claims that Abraham had only two sons, but the Bible at least tells us he had eight, six others besides Ishmael and Isaac. The Bible, excuse me, the Quran says that Abraham was thrown into a fire by King Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel. This is a costly mistake. The Bible places the story of Nimrod before Abraham. The Quran says Pharaoh's wife adopted Moses. The Bible says it was Pharaoh's daughter. The Quran places the flood of Noah in the time of Moses' day. The Bible places centuries before Moses was ever born. Another costly mistake in the Quran is that it states that Haman lived in Egypt during the time of Moses and worked for Pharaoh on the Tower of Babel. Confusing, huh? Haman, however, lived in Persia and worked for King Ahasuerus of Persia. His story is in the book of Esther. You can read it. This misplacement of this historical account is easy to trace. It's in the Word of God. There's only one solution to this serious conflict. Both cannot be right. One has to be fabricated. One has to be made up. I choose what lines up with the Word of God and what lines up with history itself, the Word of the living God. Amen? The B-I-B-L-E. Amen. Let's look at Jesus and Muhammad. The Quran claims that Jesus was a prophet sent from God to reveal divine truths. However, Muhammad was the last and final prophet of God. Let's compare the lives of Jesus and Muhammad. Let's look at the prophecies concerning their births. Let's look at what the angels had to say. Let's look at what the prophets had to say. Let's look at what history has to say. The birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus were all prophesied. The Old Testament prophets told us the city where he would be born. They told us his family lineage and that he would die. We were given prophecies to look for and to make sure he was indeed the Messiah. We were told that he would ride through Jerusalem on a donkey and that they would beat him and scourge him and hang him on a cross. We were told that his own would reject him, but that was God's plan in order to save humankind. His virgin birth was prophesied. God sent a forerunner to herald his coming. Simon was a living prophet who was told that he would not see death until he saw the Messiah. At the age of 12, Jesus was teaching the rabbis. His death was prophesied. His resurrection was prophesied. His coming again is prophesied. And even the fact that he would be laid in a borrowed tomb would be prophesied. And Jesus fulfilled every one of those prophecies and more. There are no prophecies concerning Muhammad. None. The only writings we have about Muhammad are the writings Muhammad wrote about himself. That's all there is. As a matter of fact, he didn't even know he was a prophet until he was 40. Jesus was born of a supernatural virgin birth and was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Muhammad was born to Abdullah and Amina. Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. Muhammad's father died before he was born. His mother died while he was young. He then went to live with his grandparents, and later he was raised by his uncle. According to the Bible, Jesus lived a sinless life. He was fully human, yet at the same time, he was fully God. Even at his death, he declared that no man had the power to take his life, but he gave it for a ransom for all. Even nature itself reacted when Jesus died. Are you listening to me? Even the nature, the world, the land, the earth reacted when Jesus died. The sun was darkened in the middle of the day when Jesus died. The veil in the temple was torn in two, separating man from the holy of holies when Jesus died. Some of the dead that had died were resurrected out of their ground when Jesus died and they walked around the streets. I'm about to get excited. And three days later, he rose again and was seen by many during a 40 day period then he ascended into heaven on a cloud and was witnessed by many are you listening to me as a matter of fact we are told in 1 Corinthians 5 that Jesus was seen by over 500 brethren at the same time after he was resurrected are you with me During the time of Paul, when Paul was doing his writings, 
which was approximately 25 years after this event, many of those people, I'm about to get excited, many of those people who stood around the mouth that day when two angels came by and said, why do you look at him leaving? For this same Jesus that you see leaving is the same one that's going to come back just like he left. Now listen, 25 years later, when Paul is writing the epistles, many of those people who saw Jesus left were still alive saying, yes, it was true. I was there when it happened, and I guess I ought to know. Well, glory. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is alive. Amen. He's alive forever and forever and forever. The death could not contain him. The grave couldn't keep him. Up from the grave he arose. He's alive today. How do you know he's alive? I feel him in this room right now. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Well, glory. If Johnny was here, there'd already been a lap taken. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. No man, he says, has the power to take my life. Muhammad, on the other hand, did not live a sinless life. No one even claims that he did. While Jesus never married, Muhammad had 12 or 13 wives. One of his brides was only six years old. But he didn't consummate the marriage until she was nine. Are you listening to me this morning? The Quran records the prayers of repentance of Muhammad. The Quran shows their prophet had to repent. Jesus never had to. He was fully God. (laughs) Y'all see why I'm getting excited up here? I'm talking about my Savior. (laughs) Everyone has sinned, even Muhammad. There's only one who never sinned. There's only one who never sinned. His name is Jesus. Muhammad did not die for any man's sins except his own. No one was resurrected at his death. Nature did not mourn when he died. The veil was not rent in the temple when he died. When he died, the sun kept on shining. And even the cause of his death is not fully known among his followers today. Some say he died of a fever. Some say he was poisoned. They don't even know themselves. One thing is certain. In al-Masjid al-Nabawi, or the mosque of the prophet in Medina, Saudi Arabia, one thing is for certain that I can tell you about. In that tomb is the body and the bones and the remains of Muhammad. But in Jerusalem, there is a tomb. There is no body there because Jesus was resurrected on the third day. (laughs) Hallelujah. Jesus, in Matthew 19 and 14, Jesus held children on his lap and he prayed for their needs because he said, let the little children come unto me. What did Muhammad do with the little children? He had a nine-year-old in his bed. Jesus died for the sins and the punishment of man. In Romans chapter 4, In verse 25, we find that Muhammad asked others to die for his cause. The Bible says, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Muhammad asked others to die for his cause, but Jesus died for you. Jesus died, but was resurrected. He is no longer dead, but is alive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 55, we read, O grave, or death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Why? Because Jesus has victory over it. Muhammad died and is still dead. Jesus is now our intercessor. In Romans 8.34, he's our intercessor. 
before God for you and for me. We find in Romans 8, 34, who is he who condemns us? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who is also makes intercession for us while I'm preaching the word of God to you. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, your intercessor is standing before the throne pleading your case to God. Jesus said, bless them. I purchased them. I died for them. I bled for them. Heal them. Deliver them. Save their children. He's asking God to do something for you. Muhammad can't do that. Muhammad claims there is no intercessor. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Bible says that Jesus will return one day for his people and will judge the people on earth for their sin. The Quran does not say Muhammad will return or be resurrected or that he will judge anyone. The Bible promises a heaven that is pure and filled with worship. And Jesus Christ himself will be the light. The Quran promises a carnal heaven that is geared to appeasing the natural appetite of man. The Bible says Jesus will be there. The Bible tells us Abraham... Isaac and Jacob will be there. The Bible says that there will be streets that are paved with gold. The Bible tells us there will be 24 thrones that are in heaven. The Bible talks about the foundations and the beautiful, beautiful stones that make up the foundations of the 12 gates to the city. The Bible says there will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, anything of that nature. But the Quran says this about heaven. If you're a martyr and you die, then you could get to commit sin, fornication with a thousand virgins. Y'all listen to me this morning. Heaven is not a place where you go commit fornication. Praise team, join me on stage. I've got to stop. We Christians, born again believers, disciples, followers of Jesus, we believe that Jesus is more than a prophet. No, we know that Jesus was more than a prophet. He is God's only begotten Son. You cannot believe that Jesus was merely good and make it to heaven. You cannot believe that Jesus was merely a prophet and make it to heaven. You cannot believe that Jesus just existed and make it to heaven. You can't make it to heaven because your mama believed in Jesus. You can't make it to heaven because you were raised in church. You can't make it to heaven because you attend Trenton Ministry Center every Sunday. It won't work. You can't attend, I mean, you can't go to heaven because your name is on the membership roll at Trenton Ministry Center or a Methodist church or a Baptist church. You can't get to heaven because you're church of God. You can't get to heaven because you're Baptist. You can't get to heaven because you're Methodist. You get to heaven through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is no salvation in any other name under heaven by which we must be saved other than the great name of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. In order to go to heaven, you can't just be good. In order to go to heaven, you can't just try to do right. Look at me eyeball to eyeball this morning. Even if you were saved, look at me. You get to heaven by asking Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, into your heart. So many people in the world today are trying to get to heaven some other way. 
There's a religion for anything you want to believe. There's a church for anything that you want to believe. There's a prophet for anybody you want to follow. There's a bishop and an apostle for anybody you want to follow. Now I'm getting on dangerous ground. But there's only one way. This message will be on TV and be on the radio. And I don't care to say this because I'm under the anointing right now. If you're in a church that's preaching something besides Jesus, run as fast as you can. Run! Jesus is the way! Jesus is the way! Jesus is the way! You know what's wrong with Christianity today? We're backed in a corner and we're afraid to preach. Jesus is the way. But you're in a sanctuary this morning. You're in a house of God where the preacher, and I believe the congregation will tell you, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I'm almost done. Either we're following the Lord or we're following a lunatic. You read some of the stuff he did in the Bible. Either he was Lord or he was a lunatic. How many other people did you know would go into the holy temple and turn tables over? Either he's the son of God or the son of Satan. He even, they even told him, how can Satan cast out Satan? It's because he's the son of God. He was either the blessed redeemer or he was a blasphemer. He was either, he either talked to the Father or he was a madman talking to himself because when you read the Bible, you find out before the Son ever came up, he'd go and converse with the Father. Listen to your preacher for just a moment. Everything we believe hinges up on one solitary truth. Are you ready? Jesus is Lord. I want to say that again. Everything we believe hinges on one truth. Jesus is Lord. There's only one name that is spoken that will cause hell to tremble. There's only one name spoken that causes demons to flee. <laughs> There's only one name spoken that can calm a fevered brow. There's only one name spoken that can put your family back together again. There's only one name spoken that can cause peace in the midst of darkness. There's only one name spoken when you don't know what else to do and you don't know where to turn and you're almost given up and you're backed up in a corner. But when you simply say, Jesus, 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 there's something about that name. Heaven and earth will pass away, but there's something about that name. When you prayed and you don't know what to pray and you prayed so long that you can't think of what to say anymore. When you wander around the house and you wonder, why can I pray? Brother Don, there's been times I've had to say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, I feel His presence in here. Would you stand with me all over this house? Woo! My God, I feel Him in here right now. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house. Whose Father? Jesus. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I'd have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Father, I have delivered my heart the best way I know how this morning. Now the rest is up to you. Father, right now, all over this sanctuary, 
There are people who need the name of Jesus in their life somehow this morning. God, our hope, our trust, our confidence in you. God, as this praise team leads us to worship, let your spirit fall in this house and touch people and bring them to these altars in just a few moments in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching our program today. If you don't have a home church, we'd love for you to join us at TMC. Our service times are Sunday morning at 1030 and Wednesday evening discipleship classes at 7. Check us out on Facebook and you can hear today's sermon on iTunes. Please join us next week. And at Trenton Ministry Center, we believe TMC is the place to be.